lights and everybody would just like sit down. <laughs> I've lost you guys. So today you guys can open up your Bible. Happy Mother's Day, by the way. Another round of applause for all the Bible. Today we're continuing on in our in our series of the Gospel according to John. We're going to be in John chapter 8. You guys can turn there uh, right now. We're going we're to kind of dive right in. I'll say this, just a, in, in way of warning, in way of prep. What we're going to look at today, the story that we're going to look at today, is, is incredibly relevant to the point where it, 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 it should make, if we read it properly, it should make everybody a little bit uncomfortable. A little awkward, right? And, and I think, in, in starting up, I would just I would just start a conversation like this. In John chapter one, it says two two things about Jesus that are that are that are equally and profoundly balanced in who Jesus is, um, and it says it twice. It says it in verse fourteen. It says it in verse seventeen. And then it was so it was such a deep thing that actually we sing about it every Christmas, right? On joy to the world. And we, 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 he ruled the world with, with truth and grace. That's what it is. Jesus has this perfect balance of truth and grace. And I think the best way that we can um, kind of uh, 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 unpack this is, and, and, and balance ourselves with this is to think about this. How many of you guys know somebody who's like a truth warrior, right? On Facebook or, or for good, bad, and the ugly... They just like to say the truth, what they think is the truth, right? They like to call it out. They sniff out like heresy. They sniff out, you know, anything that's wrong. And they're just like big on the truth. They're, they're sticklers for the truth. But there's one issue. You just kind of notice that they're really bad at grace, right? They're really bad at doing it in a loving way, right? There's nothing wrong with, with, with standing for truth. That's a good thing. That's a good quality. But if you lose sight of the fact that people uh, deserve respect, that, 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 that we need to have love in our conversation and grace, people are out of balance in that way, right? Maybe you see a little bit of that in yourself. I certainly do sometimes for me, right? And then you have the other side of the coin. You have people that are super good at grace, right? They're very loving. I just do my thing. I let other people do their thing. It's really just all about love. We should have more love. And what I mean by that is just let everybody do whatever they want. And, and don't worry about it, right? Just worry about yourself, right? And there's some, there's, some, there's some good in there. But a lot of times that person, if they're like me when I'm being like that, have a really hard time with hard conversations. Like there's a certain time when you, when you kind of need to speak up. You need to speak some truth. Because it's just appropriate, and, and, and we can err on the side of not doing that, right? And so that's why it's so amazing that Jesus comes on the scene, and right away, it describes him twice in one chapter as coming with this perfectly balanced truth and grace. It's really amazing. It's very relevant. And so today we're going to look at this story, right? We're going to look at this story in, in John chapter 8, which I think if you, if you go, what does that look like? Practically, in a, in, like a, in a real life situation, to be perfectly balanced with truth and grace. I think we're going to find that in this story today. And I would say this, this story should challenge everybody. It's one of the more popular stories that people will talk about when Jesus, when, when the Pharisees and the scribes, they bring a, an adult, a, a woman who's been caught in adultery, and they bring her right before Jesus publicly, and they want to know, what are you going to do about this? Right? And, and we see Jesus' response. Now, now, some people will look at this story and they'll, and, and, and they'll think it validates their position of grace. And some people will look at this story and they'll, and they'll really fight for truth, to, to add the truth component which is in here. And I want you, as we read it, first of all, I want you to see if you can see which side of the coin does this balance you on, right? If you're honest with yourself. And, 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 and then... I'm going to ask, what other things do you see in this story? So we'll read it, and we'll kind of just talk about it together. So John chapter 8. And it actually starts with, with the, the last verse. They, they put it together, the last verse of, uh, of chapter 7, which is verse, uh, uh, verse 53. It starts there. It says, they, they went each to his house, but Jesus went on to the Mount of Olives. Right? So it's, 
it, there's, it's still the Feast of Sukkot. Okay, it's the Feast of Booths. They're, they're in Jerusalem. We're still in the same time frame, um, according to this story, right? Um, they're in Jerusalem. They're, it's about six months before Jesus is going to die on a cross. Just to give you a frame of reference, he's about he's over two years past um, in ministry. Most people know who he is. He's very controversial. Remember at Sukkot, we've been seeing that that everybody's talking about who Jesus is. They're trying to figure out what it all means. Some people think that he's a, a, a deceiver. Other people are wondering, maybe he's one of these like pictures that we see in the Old Testament, the prophet like Moses, or maybe he's like, like the, the suffering servant Messiah, or maybe he's the, the King David Messiah that they all want him to be, right? Who is this Jesus? And, and, and they have this, this kind of ruckus that happens, and then it, it's all kind of over. And this is a resetting of the story when it says, they each went to their house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and then we're going to see a reset to the next day. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple in Jerusalem. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. What do you guys see in this story? What stands out to you? In this story, let's have a little group dialogue. Yes, Justin. What did you write on the ground? What did you write on the ground is a question that you have. Of course, lots of you, if you read commentators, everybody kind of gives an opinion. Maybe he wrote this, maybe he, uh, uh, one of the more popular ones is maybe he was writing a verse from Jeremiah that talks about kind of this, this, this idea of, of casting the stone, and it also actually ties into the living water, which is a part of the story. But we don't really know, right? We don't know. And, and I would say this, that, whoever, that in the, in the, the writer here is intentionally not putting it in there maybe for a reason. You ever, you ever know that sometimes the, the, the details that are, are not in, put in the story are actually a statement that's meant to be a part of the story? So yeah, we don't know what he, what he says, but that's very interesting, right? Everybody dialogues that. Yes, Cassie? I found it interesting that the older people left first. Because sometimes as we get older, we get more set in our ways. Ooh. So it was really interesting that they caught on first. And it is on. interesting, yeah. It, 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 it gives this, it only gives certain details. It doesn't give us a detail that we want, right? What is he right? We don't want to know. And it does give us this detail of who left first. The older one, one by one they left. And the older ones left first. And, and so what, what does that mean? Maybe it means, maybe it's just a, a deep common Terry, like, right? Like, a, the, the, normally people would be set in their ways. We don't know for sure, but that's a detail that's in there. It's interesting. Yes. Yeah, Matt. In the Levitical law, it says if a man sleeps with a woman, both of them shall be stoned. But here, the men change it to fit their need and yeah. only to stone. Woman. Yeah, interesting. Well, actually, in, in Leviticus, it does. It brings up the man and the woman, and it doesn't say stone. It doesn't, it doesn't say how, right? It just says be put to death. So they're adding to the scriptures, first of all, something that was kind of like common knowledge when they add the actual specific punishment. And then, yeah, where's the dude? Right? They, they bring the woman here, and here's the thing. It was very specific. It was very hard to catch somebody in the act of adultery. Literally, by their standards uh, 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 of accusing somebody, you couldn't just see them leave the house together and make an assumption. You had to actually see the physical act in order to make this accusation. And it couldn't be one person. It had to be multiple people. 
What are they doing in the room where this is? And if they're there, where's the guy? Why is it just this woman? Right? And then it gives a little commentary of their intention. They really didn't care about the woman. They wanted to trap Jesus. They were using her. Yeah, good point. Yes? Oh, uh, Jesus engaged her in conversation by asking her a question. Isn't this amazing, right? How they treat her and how Jesus treats her. And Jesus talks to her. He listens to her. He gets a little deeper than the surface. What, the, what, all, what they see and what Jesus sees is obviously two different things. Very good. Yeah. Yes, James. One of the things that always stands out about to me about this passage is the idea of how Jesus interacts with people that are sinners, that yes. don't believe what we believe. Mm -hmm. That he didn't condemn her, he didn't yell at her, he didn't throw what the law was in her face. He just loves her and then tells her, go and sin no more. Yep. So he loves her and then tells her the truth in love. Yeah. And that stands out to me is that the only people you see Jesus chew out were the people that professed to be perfect, that professed, we know what is right and we are doing what is right. And Jesus was like, no, no you're not. Yeah. You're so sinful and you think you're perfect and you are like hurting what, what God desires for us. It's amazing, huh? It's amazing. Yeah. Andrew. James, you kind of said what I was going to say, but it is a big, um, difference in condemnation and the grace and how Jesus sees her and that sin is sin. And he loves her and he tells them that, you know, if you're without sin, then you can cast the first stone. But then they realize we're all sinful. And that's all sin, it. yeah. Any, any, in no way is, is Jesus or this story, there's no way to use this story to condone an adulterous lifestyle, right? Right. That's not what the point of the story is. It's not to condone an adulterous lifestyle, but it's to see beyond this woman's one act and realize there's more there. And all of that, all the more that's there matters, right? Yeah. Well, you guys have some great commentary. I want to, I want to dig in here a little bit. The first thing that's interesting, uh, Maybe you guys, if you were reading in your own Bible, or if you were looking up here, you notice that there's a double parenthesis around the story, right? That's, that's important for us to see. Why is there a double parenthesis around the story? Here's why. This story is not in any of the early manuscripts. What does that mean? That means that when the way that we know that the scriptures that we have now are accurate, meaning that in the original language, the copies in the original language that we have today are, are, are the same as the, the original copies that were written way back when. It's ancient literature. They use this thing called text criticism, right? Textual criticism. And they have a, a scientific way of looking at it. And the fact is we have lots of manuscripts uh, of, of, of the early writings, right? The earliest writings. And we put them together and we compare them and there's a checks and balances type process and you can say, wow, they're, they're remarkably the same. And there's no major doctrines that are changed. This particular story is not in any of the earliest manuscripts. It, it, it shows up later, right? In, in the later manuscripts. So there's two theories. The first theory is probably the least likely of the theories, to be honest, but it's interesting to think about. The first theory that they have is that possibly John actually did write this originally in, this, uh, in, in the text, and that this idea of condoning adultery, that, that they might have seen it, was so controversial that they took it out early. And then they found it and added it later. Well, there really just isn't a lot of evidence to, to back that. It's kind of a cool story. The only real meat that you have there is one of the first commentators who wrote around 100, right? So he's, he's, he's not even 100 years after this is writing. Origen, he actually references this story, but he doesn't connect it to John. He talks about this, this, this person, uh, this sinful woman that came, right? And so, so that's probably, it's a, a neat story. The, the, the other theory that we have is that this is probably a, a, a story that actually happened, right? In, in the end of John, it'll tell you that Jesus did so many things that didn't end up in these four gospel accounts. He said, if we wrote down everything that happened, the, 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 the volumes, the books wouldn't even fit on the earth, right? All these things. 
So the idea is that this story really did happen. John didn't write it into his initial uh, writing, but maybe even he talked about it when he told stories about Jesus when they're sitting around the campfire, and, and, and it got passed along, and then it got added later, right? We don't know, though, right? But it is important. How do you deal with this text? That's a, like, if you're going to preach this, that's a question I have to ask. Like, do we just omit this, or do we add it? And so, so how, do we do, how do we deal with this? And so I'm going to share with you some wisdom that I got from, from a scholar that, that wrote in, a, in the ESV Study Bible. This is what he said. This is, this is his advice, and I think it's pretty wise, and I, I think, and, and, I'll, and I'll look at how we're going to handle this, right? So, so he says this. I think it's in here. He says, there is considerable doubt that this story is part of John's original gospel, for it is absent from all of the oldest manuscripts. But there is nothing in it unworthy of sound doctrine. It seems best to view this story as something that probably happened during Jesus' ministry, but that was not originally part of what John wrote in his gospel. Therefore, it should not be considered as part of Scripture, and should not be used as the basis for building any point of doctrine unless confirmed in Scripture. Does that seem wise to you guys in balance? So here's how we're going to approach it. I want to look at this story because I think there's lots of value and we, and we can really see some deep things that I think we need to see in our culture, right? It really speaks to some, some, some questions about how we behave as Christians who believe in a world that does not, right? How do we do that? So it's, it's very good. But every point that I make, I'm going to give you a cross-reference and we're going to tie. We're going to say, does, does the rest of the scriptures actually say this exact same thing or is this something new? Because if it's something new, I think... We, we, it's, it's, it's doesn't, it doesn't hold a lot of weight. Is you guys all comfortable with that? All right. Well, let me pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the realness of scriptures. I thank you that this actually, realizing that, 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 that there was such strict text criticism and such honesty, that we can actually look at this popular story and, 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 and see that it's in parentheses, that they're honest about it, and, and they're willing to point out the fact that this isn't in the early manuscripts. And that the other stuff is. And how much strength that that has. But I pray beyond all of that, that your Holy Spirit, who is alive, would speak to us things that we need to hear from you today. As we look at this scripture and all the cross-references, may they make sense to us. And may, may, may they pierce us. May they bring us to a... a, 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 a a more balanced, Christ-like life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. So the first thing I see when I'm looking at this story is I see, well, wildly unfair. Right? There's something wildly unjust that's going on with the way that they're behaving. And there's, a, there's a, 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 an old Jewish, an ancient Jewish value that I think speaks to this, um, this story. And it's the story of honest scales. In Proverbs, it talks about honest scales, or what you might call favorable scales. And we see Jesus speak to this because here the, 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 the scribes and the Pharisees, they have one agenda for how they want to use this story, right? They have, they have an agenda. And Jesus, right away, takes takes their own way of thinking, and he speaks so deeply into it that they all bail. Even the oldest, more set in their ways ones, leave first. Right? He, 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 he makes such a, a, a point that they're being hypocrites that they just can't, they can't do anything about it but just leave and come back maybe another day and try again. Right? And he says, you, he, who has, he who has is without sin, cast the first stone. Now, of course, they want Jesus to, to, to accuse her, right? They want him to accuse her, not because they care about her, because they want to catch him, and they want to and they, and they 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 use it against Jesus. They're trying to bring Jesus down, right? And they're using an unfair scale of this woman. They're, it's unbalanced. It's, it's, it's favored in their favor. As a matter of fact, you, you have to look, and most commentators will say, there's no way that they could have caught this woman in the act of adultery unless they planned it. Unless they set her up. How fair is that? They set her up for failure so that they can catch Jesus 
They use her. And so this is unbalanced scale. In Proverbs 11.1 1, it says, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. A lot of what they're looking at is, is if, if you were going to the marketplace, like a farmer's market at that time, and they were going to sell you grain, right? It was the, the person who was selling the grain would have a scale. On one side, it would have a weight that said whatever it was. Let's say, we'll use our, our terminology. Let's say it said five pounds, right? And then you would put five pounds of grain on there, and it should balance perfectly. But a lot of times, kind of like what you, what you, what you see like in the circus or at the fair, right? They, they do these little tricks. Right? And they, and they actually, maybe, they say that it's five pounds, but it's not. It's only four pounds. They say it's five pounds, but it's four pounds. So they put four pounds of grain in there, and you pay for five pounds, and you only got four pounds. It's unfair. And it says an abomination to the Lord. That's what this proverb is talking about. But is, the proverbs are, are always telling you short stories, right? That, that are they're trying to teach you something about all of life, right? It's not, it's not just about scales, it's about life. Jesus brings it a, a little bit more to life in Luke 6, 36 through 38. He says this, he says, Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. And then he says this. He says, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. This idea here is that in the scale, he says, when you're, gonna, when you're weighing out a scale, and it's your job to, to, to be fair, push down the grain. Right? Don't, don't let it spill over. Push it down. Shake it so there's no air in there. Make sure there's getting as much in there as you can to where it's spilling over. Use that as your measure. Right? We have a common uh, term here. Like when, you're, when, you, when, you, when, you're, when you go to the bakery, right? It's kind of a long-standing tradition. When you go to the bakery and you ask for a dozen uh, you know, uh, donuts, right? They give you 12 donuts and then one more for good measure. Right? What is that called? It's called a baker's dozen. In essence, Jesus is saying, live as if you're giving a baker's dozen. Weigh the scales favorably. And he ties it to when you're being merciful. He ties it to not condemning. He ties it to forgiveness. And he ties it to how you give. With, 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 with favorable scales. Do the, do the scribes and the Pharisees use favorable scales? No way. They, they catch her in a corrupt way, right? And, and, and they, they don't do anything to try to help her. They, they just bring her and they want to use her. And they don't even care about her. They just care about Jesus. They're using her to trap Jesus. And he's pointing out, look how corrupt you guys have become, that you're willing to sink this low. For, for whatever your agenda is, right? Some things that I think about when I look at this, and I think they're very scriptural, is this. How do, we, how do we live our lives with a favorable measure? The first thing is this. Assume the best of people. Assume the best of people. I am horrible at that. I don't know about you, but for me, like when I'm driving down the street... And somebody, you know, this is inevitable, right? You're on the freeway or you're, or you're kind of in like a gridlock traffic. Everybody's going the same speed. But there's one guy, right? You know who he is. You've seen him. He's driving fast. He's cutting everybody off. And what, am I, what do I assume? Jerk! Oh, you think you're better than me? You think where you have to go is more important than where I have to go? That's my first assumption, right? He's a jerk, right? What if we thought to assume the best of them? Maybe they just got the worst news of their life. And they're just out of sorts. They're not thinking clearly. I never think that. Right? Maybe his wife is in the back of the car and she's pregnant and he's rushing her to the hospital. I never assume that. Right? I never think that. I think, you think you're better than me, right? That's my assumption. How, how, how can we apply that in so many areas? You come to church, no one shakes your hand. Maybe they're shy. Maybe they're there for the first time too. But we don't do that. That place is clanking. Right? We just make these first assumptions. 
Or, or when we look at somebody, we make up. We, we don't always assume the best. And I had I had a, a humbling experience this week. I'm at Starbucks. That's not abnormal. But I'm just telling you, it was almost like a Saturday Night Live uh, a comedy because I walk into Starbucks and everybody, every stereotype that I could, that, that gets under my skin or that I can think of was there. <laughs> I walk in, right, and the first thing I notice is there's this police officer, and he's eating, guess what, a donut. And he's, and he looks like he eats a lot of donuts. I'll just put it like that, right? And so I'm processing this. There's a couple over here, right? It's two girls. And the way that they're dressed and the things that their t-shirts say, it became very obvious to me that they're together as a couple. You know what I mean, right? Over outside, there was a guy, and I was walking by, and I could smell him right away. He was a homeless guy. He was reading his newspaper, and he just had spread out all of his belongings all over the place, right? I walk in, there was like a, a, a gangbanger looking guy, I don't know if he was, what I didn't ask him like, you know, like, what's your sign? I didn't do any of that, but, but, but I just, I kept my eye on him, you know what I mean? Like, I'm gonna take my eye off that guy. And it was just like everywhere, was, I'm telling you, it was like a comedy. And God just really stopped me in that moment. I feel like it was the Holy Spirit, probably because I'm processing this. And he said, stop and do this for me, Kenny. Look at every single one of them and start here. That is a human being created in the image of God. That person has a whole story filled with hurt and pain and unmet expectations. All of these things, all of these layers in this person, and it was as if God said, flip it around. The first thing you see, let, you, let that be the last thing that you see. The first thing that you should assume is think the best of this person. Do you, are, you, are you willing to sit down with that person and hear their story? Then don't make a judgment about them. It just felt like convicted and at the same time skipping with joy and freedom because it's nice to know that this world isn't completely falling apart and God still has his hand on it. And God still cares about people. And all of these people are not just lost, they're waiting to be found. That's the way God looks at people. And I just started to realize that the, the scribes and the Pharisees saw this woman as a commodity that they were willing to use for their agenda. Beyond all of the adultery and everything, she was a commodity that they were willing to use. And they were willing to put her to death for their own purposes. And Jesus saw her completely different. He saw her sin the same. He saw how damaging it was to her. But he saw her completely different. And he saw her as somebody, not that he wanted to put to death, but that he wanted to breathe life into. That he wanted to see grow. That he wanted to see prosper. That he wanted to see free. Jesus sees things completely different. He assumes the best of people. Well, what about when you, you know, like, you can't just assume the best of everybody, right? Like, sometimes you... So there's a, there's a line with that, right? Like, I'm not going to go like, yeah, you, you, you came to my house and you were looking through the window and I caught you, and I'm going to assume that, you know, you're a decorator. Right? <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, I, there's a point like, where you have to have like some, you know, you can't just be naive. But I, but I think here's this point uh, speaks into this. It's a biblical point is practice the art of overlooking wrong. This is when you know that it's wrong. You know that that person is in the wrong, but you practice the art of overlooking wrong. Proverbs 19.11, good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. When's the last time you just were like, I'm going to overlook this offense? My dad used to say it like this, choose your battles wisely. Are you really trying to win this person, or are you trying to win the fight? Are you trying to win the argument? I have to weigh that all the time. Are, do you have practiced the art of, of uh, overlooking wrong? Now in Luke 6, 36 and 38, we saw Jesus said, be merciful, don't uh, condemn not, be forgiving, give. And he says, what measure you use, the, the measure that you use will be, will be used against you. The very next thing he says, so this is connected to that. He says in, 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 uh, in verse 29, he says, To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. 
And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Now you have to put this into real terms. Like you go to Urban Outfitters, you get a dope tunic, right? You're cruising around with your, your name brand tunic on, and then someone just comes and takes it from you, and you're like, oh, you could, you could have my, oh my, whatever, you know? Just giving away, overlooking wrong. Jesus is helping us see that we, we don't naturally do this, do we? We're not naturally good at truth and grace. We err back and forth on, on, on between these things all the time. And then lastly, be generous in every way. Paul says in Colossians 3, 12 through 13, he says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. So first he points out, the way that God looks at you, he sees you as chosen. He sees you as chosen. You're, you're created in God's image. He sees you as holy. Not because of what you do, but because of the blood of Jesus. That's, he, he treats you better than you deserve. And he sees you as beloved. He loves you. Even when we're yet sinners, he died for us. He goes, for you guys who are holy, beloved, or chosen... Meaning this, God has given you so much grace. And he says, in light of that, put on this, compassion and hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you all also must forgive. In other words, you've been given so much grace we should be walking around running this in grace. The next question is, is, as you look at this story, you see how Jesus is. Do you want to be like that? Do you want to be more like Jesus? And you might say, well, does the Bible really say that we should be like Jesus? Or is that just something that Christians like to talk about? Right? So 1 John 2, 6 says this, Whoever says he abides in him, whoever says he's a follower of Christ, Ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. We should want to be more like Jesus. What do we see Jesus doing here? We see Jesus showing compassion. Jesus shows compassion for this woman without condoning her sin. Isn't that brilliant? He shows compassion for her without condoning her sin and at the same time without condemning her. Can you do that? Because I always like him on one side of the other. I can say, hey, that's wrong, right? And what you're doing is wrong. But do I go? The, but, is it, but, is, but do I come across as condemning? How do I do that? How do we be more like Jesus? Is kind of the, the, the answer there. So Jesus showed compassion without condoning sin or condemning anyone. And I thought, when you see Jesus doing this, do we have any examples in the Bible of uh, of, of somebody who's not Jesus, right? It's like. Like, when I say, like, be like Jesus, like, how am I going to be like Jesus? But look, there's, there's the Apostle Paul. Paul said this at one point. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. He said, watch how I follow Christ and, and, and follow along. He says, none of us are going to be Jesus. Anybody here attained to the, to the level of Jesus yet? Because you can come up and take over. Right? I haven't either. Right? But I look at Paul, and Paul's encouraging to me. And he has, Paul, Paul said this in... In, uh, in Romans 8, he goes, he goes, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there's now no condemnation. So, so Paul was a big guy, no condemnation. What does that look like practically? And this is section 3. I call it Paul's no condemnation tips. First this. What if we walked around like this, considering yourself the worst sinner in the room? What if I walked into Starbucks with all these stereotypical people, and I realized, I'm the most stereotypical one here. Right? Like, I'm the white guy that loves Jesus, and, and or whatever, you know, the, the stereotype they might have had for me, because I had my Bible with me. And I didn't even think about that when I was going there. Like, I wonder how they're viewing me right now. Right? But we're the worst sinner in the room. And Paul says this in 1 Timothy 1.15. Towards the end of his ministry, he's got a lot of mistakes that he's made. He's, hum he's, he's humble at this point. And he goes, he goes, little Timothy, look, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ, is, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. That's his attitude. He's like, everybody's a sinner. We all need Jesus. We all have that in common. And I'm the worst sinner in the room. I'm the, I'm, I'm the, I'm the worst. Imagine if you, if you treated people that way. 
He didn't just see them in light of like their label, right, their sin. But you looked at them as somebody who needed Jesus, and then you stopped and you go like, you know what, I'm a mess too. See, I don't think, I don't think being judgmental is so much about figuring out what's right and wrong, and, and saying, that's, I don't think that's right, I don't think that that's okay, I don't think that's, a, that's, a, that's an okay behavior. I don't think that's judgmental. I think it's judgmental when you forget that you're a mess. You're good at seeing other people's mess, and you're not good at seeing your own. Didn't Jesus talk like this? Like, like before you take the speck of dust out of your neighbor's eye, remember you got a two-by-four in your eye. Right? Like, considering I'm the worst sinner in the room. Right? Thinking the best of other people helps with this condemnation thing. And the second one is treat people better than they deserve. How many of you guys have been treated by God better than you deserve? Me too. That's what Paul's saying in Ephesians 4. He goes, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Why? As God in Christ forgave you. We can treat people better than they deserve or that we think they deserve because we've been treated better than we deserve. What's the opposite of that? Entitlement. If we're entitled, if we think, you know what, we're, we're cleaned up, we're doing pretty good, you're a mess, you know, you should be more like me. I can't imagine why no one wants to follow Jesus the way I do, right? To treat people better than they deserve. And this is a deep one. Relationships are the context for hard conversations. What do I mean by that? Relationships are the context for hard conversations. You might look at it like this. When you, have a con when you have a conversation, there's more going on than just an exchange of words. Have you noticed that? Right? There's, there's, there's your body language. There's, there's all of your assumptions. There's your previously like, conceived ideas. There's the tone of voice. There's all of these things. Plus, have you ever noticed like some conversations that people have, if there's no relationship, it's, 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 it's offensive, but in the context of relationship, it's actually appropriate, right? Like if, if somebody, um, you're at Target, and someone comes over and says, you shouldn't dress so provocatively, and they've never met you before, right? Then you're like, who do you think you are, right? But if it's your dad and you're 13, go dad, right? <laughs> Like, per, the relationship's important, is what I'm saying, right? And Paul speaks to this. He says this, in Ephesians 4.15, he says, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Speak the truth in love. We've heard that before. The Greek terminology is actually, it doesn't say the word speak, it's truthing. It's truthing in love. It's how you hold the truth. You might think of it like this. It's not just what you believe, but it's how you hold your beliefs. In love. Truthing in love. Are we good at truthing in love? I would suggest this. It's pretty hard to truth in love if you don't know somebody. It's pretty hard to truth in love when all you see is their end label. When you haven't processed and said, this is a, this is a, this is a human being created in the image of God. They have a whole story. Maybe I should get to know some of that story before I speak into the story. Speaking the truth in love is, is about context a lot of the time. Do you have the context with this person to have that hard conversation? A little Facebook tip. Most of the most of the Facebook posts that you, that you comment in the bottom should be private messages. Right? Because that's what it says in, Ma in Matthew 18. It talks about that. It says, when you, when you want to correct somebody, Matthew 18, it tells you how to do it. It says, first, go to that person one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, I think that's a private message in Facebook terminology, not for everyone to hear. Right? So the Bible speaks a lot about social media, is what I'm saying, and context. <laughs> right? So, so speaking the truth in love. Now I want to look at something Paul says from a completely different uh, viewpoint, but I think it has the same thing. It's, it's the, do you have a context for this relationships? Relationships should be the context for our conversation. 1 Corinthians 5, 12 and 13, Paul goes like this. He goes, for what am I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge 
God judges those outside the church. Looking at this deeply and in context, I think what Paul is saying is the outsider is the non-Christian for one, right? We're not, we're not, it's not our job to judge outsiders. Matter of fact, in the same letter, Paul goes like this. If this resurrection thing's not true, then YOLO! He goes, eat, drink, and be merry. That's the way that we should live if the resurrection isn't true. But if the resurrection is true, then there's some things that we should orient ourselves around. Right? We can't expect somebody outside of that belief to orient themselves like we do who are inside the belief. First, we talk about Jesus, right? That's why he goes, I just preach Christ and Christ crucified in this letter. I want them to know Jesus first. And then it says, those who are inside the church. I would suggest it doesn't just mean people who are labeled Christians. It means people who are inside your church. Who you have a relationship with. You don't need to go to somebody else who you know is a Christian, but you don't even know them, and start pointing everything, you know. No, it's, he's talking about your church family. He's talking about the peop like, like people that you've taken the time to get to know. People that you've taken the time to process and go, I know your story. And then, you're able to do it in love. You're not trying to correct your pet peeves. You're trying to help them take their next step. Because in, if you miss that, here's, here's what you're going to miss. Here you got, you got a, a kid uh, who's a young Christian. And they do like five of your most hated sins. They're like blatant. Kid bugs me, right? I'm going to disciple them, meaning I'm going to fix them. Right? And you start with those five things. How do you know those are the next five things God wanted to start with? How do you know that there aren't deeper things going on that he needs to deal with before that you can even get there? Right? Unless you're willing to have a relationship with them. So it takes place in the context of relationship. The last thing I want to look at is what Jesus says at the end is kind of interesting, right? It seems like all of this argument is for grace, 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 don't condemn, and then at the end, he throws in this zinger, and go and sin no more, right? Did you, did you cast that part? He goes, go and sin no more. A lot of commentary about this. Why does Jesus phrase it like that? Go and sin no more. Really? She's going to go from being an adulterous woman to no sin? Is that what you're asking, Jesus? not what Jesus is asking. I believe what Jesus is asking, he's asking her to reorient her life towards following Christ. He knows her life is oriented towards sin. She says things like this, I'm just doing what makes me happy. He looked at it like this, oh, it's oriented towards sin. That sin won't make you happy. It's not making you happy, is it? He offers her a new orientation. <laughs> Follow me, sin no more. He's redirecting her life. Reorienting your life towards following Jesus. I would say it like this. This is a beautiful invite. Jesus is inviting her into a new way of living. Do you think if she's an adulterous woman that she's happy? You guys ever met somebody with deep, deep issues, deep sin issues, that, uh, that is better off for those? No, it doesn't happen, right? He's offering her a new way of life, a better way of life. And, he's, and, he, and he brings up this, that repentance is a beautiful thing. Repentance is a beautiful thing. Repentance is when you, when, when you change direction. You realize the direction of my life is not the right direction. I'm going to reorient my direction the, and redirect my life towards Christ, towards following Jesus. That's what he's inviting her to. And repentance is a beautiful thing. In Psalm 32, why don't the worship team come back up? In Psalm 32 is this, this psalm beautifully uh, uh, described by David. Now this is after David had gone through the worst sin in his life. He had committed adultery. He had committed a murder. And he lied about it for a whole year. Until his friend, in the context of a relationship named Nathan, came to him in love and spoke truth into his life. And David says this, this is how he describes it. He says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. But he's saying, 
When I was just sitting in my sin all alone, trying to deal with it myself, I, I felt horrible. I felt all alone. I felt the weight of shame. I didn't want to leave the house. I didn't want to be around people. I was broken. And then he goes like this. The change in the story he goes in, in verse 5. He goes, Then I acknowledged my sin to you, God. And I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. This is the beautiful freedom he's talking about. It's the same thing with this woman. He's saying, look, the way that you're living right now, yeah, you got caught by them and you got out of it this time. And, and, and there's grace and love and I do love you. But look, I love you enough to tell you this. I'm offering, follow me. Reorient your life. The direction you're going doesn't lead to life. You're doing what you think will make you happy, but it won't. It won't make you happy. It'll make you miserable. I, if you love checking off boxes right now, you're going to hate me because I'm going to finish my sermon right here. We haven't checked off all the, filled, we haven't filled in all the blanks. <laughs> That's okay, don't judge me. I'm a human. Created in the image of God. And have a whole story. But I would, I, would, I would challenge this. For me, this has broken my heart this, this week, look, thinking about this. And, I, and, I, and I've asked this question, where has my compassion gone? What, is, what has gone on inside of my heart, inside of my thinking? What has happened to me that I've lost a brokenness and a love for sinners. A love for the lost. That I'm, that I'm tempted to see people and label them. I was just telling Mario that I had a situation at work recently where, where, where this is, there's a guy at work and we kind of we, we rub heads, right? And I kind of just leave him alone. But, but recently, it's been harder. And I've, I've noticed... He's changed. And I equated it to this. Like something happened. He, got, he kind of got an award at, at work. And ever since then, I thought, he's got such a big head now. Right? And I thought, man. And I, and I just started liking him less and less. If I'm being honest. Every time I'd see him, I, it just bothered me. And I'm such a good Christian, I would go the other way. <laughs> and I wouldn't say anything. But my heart, my heart was not right. I just found out that he's going through some things that I can't even imagine in his life. And it all started at the same time that he got this award. And I thought the award changed him. And I was frustrated with him. But now, I know he's got a different story than I thought. And it makes a lot more sense. And I wish I would have just had that compassion on the forefront. And I don't know how about you. I don't know if you can look at your own life and see how these types of things affect you too. But I want to be more like Jesus. I want to see people the way Jesus sees people. I want to love people the way Jesus loved people. So my suggestion is that as we're worshiping, let's just pour ourselves out to God. Maybe you're like Paul and you have been kind of hiding. Maybe you just need to have that conversation with God like, God... I can't hide from you. And it's miserable to try. It's going to be, just come and take all of me, maybe. Maybe you just need to have a time of confession. Maybe you need to come forward and you need to have someone pray with you. Maybe, maybe you don't know what you need and, and that's where you need to start. Go, God, I don't even know what I need right now, but I know I need you. And just see how he stirs in you. But whatever it is that you need to do, let's all, let's all respond during this time.